Does the artillery Sidewinder X2 blow the competition out of the water? Or is it just another mediocre mid-range 3D printer with a few bells and whistles? In this video, I'm going to attempt to find out and help you decide whether this 3D printer is right for you. Full disclosure, I was sent this 3D printer by geekbuying.com to review with zero terms except that I offer you, my viewer, a substantial $70 discount should you decide to buy from them using my discount code. Purchase links and discount codes are all in the description should you decide to use them. As with any purchase, please do your own research before placing an order. As this printer was sent to me for review, I don't actually have any purchasing experience with geek buying myself. What this does mean though, is that I'll be 100% honest in this review as with all my reviews, and I'm not being put under any pressure to make this printer sound better than it is to try and get you to buy it. The decision is completely up to you. Okay, let's dive in. As you might imagine, the Sidewinder X2 is an evolution of the Sidewinder X1. There were a number of issues with the X1 and it appears that most if not all of them have been fixed on the X2. Rather than just listing them all, I'll mention them as we find them. I also won't bore you with the full specification as there's a link below where you can read that all for yourself, but what I will do is give you the highlights. The Sidewinder has a pretty large build volume with a bed that's 300 by 300 mil and a print height of 400 mil. That's just under 12 inches square by just over 15 and a half inches tall. It's supplied with a Titan style direct drive extruder, volcano style hot end, has automatic bed leveling, a three and a half inch touchscreen, a 32 bit mainboard, and an AC heated bed for extremely quick warm up times, even though this does come at a cost, which I'll explain later. The Sidewinder X2 comes almost ready to run. You simply slot the frame into place and tighten four captive bolts. Then you only have to plug in a couple of stepper plugs and the run out sensor as all the hot end and gantry wiring is handled by one plug that goes in when you attach the gantry frame. From opening the box, you'll probably have the printer ready to turn on within about 10 minutes, which is really impressive. And there's obviously been a lot of thought gone into the setup process. My first impressions before turning the printer on are that it's very neat and big. It's described as a desktop printer, but your desk would have to be pretty large to accommodate this monster. When compared to something like a Creality CR10S Pro, it feels like a much more consumer friendly product. There are no wires to snag and very few open channels for dust and small bits of filament to collect in. As with all new printers, I took my time to make sure that everything moved freely and that all rollers were tensioned correctly. I made small adjustments, but nothing like the kind of work I had to do on my Ender 3, for example. On some other new printers, I found some fixings ridiculously tight and then others too loose. There's no sign of bad assembly on the X2 though, which is a really positive sign. When turning on the printer for the first time, I was immediately struck by the way it moves. If I had to describe my initial impression of this printer in one word, it would be aggressive. Now the way you interpret that may be very different to me, but to begin with, it made me very cautious about getting the nozzle anywhere near the bed. Even though I got the printer bolted together and turned on very quickly, I spent at least the same amount of time again building up trust in the fast movements before lowering the nozzle down. I was probably being overcautious, but I've since seen that even Angus at Maker's Muse managed to hit the bed at this stage, so I'm glad I took my time. The bed comes with a paper cover for a reason. The bed surface is also not removable, so once you damage it, you've got to live with it. Once I'd manually leveled the bed and run the auto leveling sequence, I felt a lot happier about the speed this machine likes to work at. If this was my first 3D printer though, I would say that the speed of movement and minimal guidance for how to run through the leveling process could be a bit overwhelming and would have me worried about breaking something. The manual does have a written guide for how to complete auto leveling, but I didn't feel it was comprehensive enough for a complete beginner. Also, you need to add a line into your startup G-code within your slicing software to use the auto leveling feature, which may seem strange to a new user. I'm doing this with my hands because it's not actually automatic bed leveling. It's a saved bed mesh that allows the printer to follow any contours on a bed that's not completely flat. The X2 can do this because it has a bed probe that is effectively artillery's own version of a BL touch. Unlike a lot of 3D printers, the X2 is supplied with a USB stick instead of an SD card. If you want to use an SD card, you can, but personally, I prefer the feeling of carrying and plugging in a USB stick, but this may be just because it makes me feel a little bit like I'm in a spy movie. The only problem with this is that the port is on the top surface, and even though I haven't done it yet, I'm pretty certain that I'll catch it with my hand at some point and snap it off. Also, as both ports face up, they'll inevitably fill up with dust and dirt eventually if you don't cover them. The spool holder sits on top of the frame and is all very functional, but it does feel a little bit like an afterthought when compared to the build quality of the rest of the printer. No problem, I thought. I don't like using spool holders that leave the filament out in the open anyway. I'll just use one of my filament dry boxes. The problem with this though is that the filament runout sensor is mounted to the spool holder. 
If you move the spool, you either need to run a length of PTFE tube between it and the sensor, or move, and potentially even remove, the sensor. For the sake of this review, I didn't spend too much time on this, and it should be quite easy to modify in future if I want to. So if you're watching a 3D printer review, you're probably going to want to know how well it prints. The supplied USB stick already comes with a few files loaded, so I simply hit print and let it do its thing. The first thing that struck me is that I didn't really have to wait very long at all before it started to print. This had me checking the display to see if the printer had actually got up to temperature properly before starting. Sure enough, everything was right and the first prints completed without any issues. Even though I have no idea what this is. Answers in the comments below please. I then set up a new printer in Cura and using the Sidewinder X1 profile added the bed mesh start code. Then I rattled off a few boring calibration prints. The bench is really pretty clean and dimensionally sound, and there are no major issues with the calibration cube. Over the next few weeks I printed a lot of different things with all sorts of different filaments. I used PLA, PLA+, Silk and Rainbow PLA, PETG and TPU. The Sidewinder gave awesome prints with whichever filament I gave it. For everything shown in this video I used the printer as it came out of the box, and unless stated, with no changes to the standard Cura profile other than printing temperature, and in some cases speed. I printed big, and I printed small. I bought a selection of nozzles so I could see how it would print with different sizes, and as it's 2022 I decided to join the Rainbow Dragon craze. I have to give a big thank you here to Iono who supplied the rainbow filament for this print. I'll cover printing with rainbow filament in more depth in another video as I learned a few things that I think are worth sharing. Remember to hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on future videos. Now I did plan on testing the power loss recovery on a small unimportant print, but fate had other ideas. Around 24 hours into this 41 hour print, the power went off. Luckily for me, the feature worked perfectly. All I had to do was press resume and the Sidewinder X2 picked up exactly where it left off, leaving no evidence of any issue. I know that Brian from BV3D had a problem where his bed didn't heat back up again after a power loss, but I didn't have this so I can only assume that they fixed it in the meantime. What you will notice here is that I have a mirror taped to the bed rather than printing directly onto the build plate. There's one main reason I did this, but to explain my reasoning, we need to discuss the bed. Like the X1, the Sidewinder X2 is heated not by the more common DC voltage that you'll find on a lot of printers, but instead by mains voltage. The main benefit of this is much faster heat up times, but mains voltage poses a much greater health risk than DC voltage. Therefore, to ensure there's no electrocution risk for anyone, the bed is best made from a non-conductive material. In this case, Artillery have chosen to use glass, which is great for keeping the print surface nice and flat. But just watch this thermal image of the bed heating up to see if you can spot the issue with the choices made here. For comparison, I've added thermal images from an Ender 3 bed and a CR10S Pro. I've added markers that set points for reference, and the CR10S Pro is sideways as it's in an enclosure with the only access being from the side. As you can see, the X2 heats up way faster than the others, but there are some areas of the bed that are a lot cooler than the other areas. This is because, with the threaded fixings being bonded straight to the glass, the heating element doesn't heat these areas. There's also another cool spot near the middle, which I assume is where wiring connects to the heating element. As glass's thermal conductivity is many times lower than metal, the heat doesn't travel to the non-heated areas very well, as it would do if the bed were aluminium. As we've already discussed, we can't use aluminium in the bed because of the AC current and potential of, well, death. I did want to see if aluminium would dissipate the heat better, so I tried sitting the removable aluminium plate from my CR10S Pro on top of the glass. And sure enough, within a short while, there was a much more even spread of heat across the whole bed. So whilst I love the fast displayed heat up times of an AC bed, when printing something as intricate and tricky as an articulated rainbow dragon, I just didn't trust it to hang on to all of the print successfully. What I did instead was to tape a piece of mirror glass onto the bed and put a thin smear of PVA based glue stick on it for extra peace of mind. This meant it was a little tricky removing everything, but as the PVA glue stick dissolves in water, I could remove the print surface and run it under a tap. With a little patience, I had a successful end to a 41 hour print. Yes, I could have just put glue stick straight onto the standard bed, but then I couldn't have run it under the tap to dissolve the glue after. You may also be wondering why I didn't heat the beds up to higher temperatures. Well, what you may find surprising is these were actually the hottest temperatures that the beds could get to. Now I was more interested in the comparison between the beds rather than the ultimate temperatures, so I didn't spend a long time on calibration, but the camera I used was pretty high spec and it's going to be very close, if not spot on. The truth is that the beds on our printers don't get anywhere near as hot as we are told they do. The Sidewinder X2's maximum bed temperature is 130 degrees, but this actually only translates into 83 degrees print surface temperature. 
The CR 10S Pro is exactly the same. And the Ender 3's maximum temperature is 120 degrees, which was actually 73 degrees. The main reason for this discrepancy is that the temperature sensors are on the bottom of the bed by the heating element, and we're measuring the top surface. The lack of heat transfer through the materials and the large area being cooled are to blame for the discrepancy in the temperatures, but it would be nice to see the actual print surface temperature rather than a figure that's almost 50 degrees out. This can't really go down as a negative against the Sidewinder though because it's a problem that's shared by pretty much all 3D printers of this type. So what about other things I printed? I used vase mode and a 1mm nozzle to print this huge vase up to the maximum 400mm height and it only took 8 hours. I don't usually print this kind of thing, but I might start doing more because it looks awesome in the flesh and really shows off what the X2 can do. I then went to the other extreme and printed this intricate puzzle box from Leisure Luke with a 0.4mm nozzle and from multiple different colours. A couple of the parts had slight elephant's foot, but most needed little to no cleanup. I have to admit that I used a mirror and glue stick trick here again for some of the smaller parts as they didn't actually stick too well to the standard bed. All in all though, the tolerances were very good. Artillery advertised the Sidewinder X2 as having a 150mm per second printing speed, so I thought I'd give it a test. I printed a Benchy with a 0.8mm nozzle in 34 minutes, which is pretty fast, but obviously it doesn't look that great. It could be a lot worse though, so yes, technically it did print really fast. I tested Octoprint with no issues and had a good poke around inside the bottom case before disconnecting the hot end heater wiring to test thermal runaway protection. This worked fine, and I actually couldn't find much fault at all when it comes to the electronics and firmware. The screen is small but adequate, and all the basics are there. Artillery's own motherboard is nice, with removable stepper drivers, and it's really nice to see ferrules on all wires, which is the safest way to use these kind of screw terminals. Because of the 32-bit mainboard on the X2, you can now save settings to the EE prom, which I don't believe you could do on the X1. You can also see the end of the bed wiring here, showing that there is now a high-quality flat cable carrying power to the bed, which was not the case on the previous model, which was one of the major issues of the X1. One thing I didn't love about the bottom cover was the lack of support and fixings. This means that the bottom panel can flex and rub on other metal parts, which in some cases causes a resonance through the printer with certain movements. I'll definitely be adding some panel support here at some point. I also had a strange chirping noise with fast print head movements, which turned out to be the hot end cooling fan catching the wire grill. After spacing it away with a couple of washers, the noise went away though. Now all these little noises wouldn't usually show up, but one major positive for the X2 is its incredibly low noise levels. The printer is completely silent while idling, and when the fans do come on, they whisper quiet. To show you what I mean, here's a comparison with my Ender 3. As you can hear, the difference is drastic. So just to demonstrate how quiet this printer is, you can actually print with it through the night. Noise? Sorry, it was just it was just a printer. What was that little you know, Oh sorry mate, it was just me. Sorry, go go back to bed, it's okay. Yeah, that startup beep isn't really needed, is it? So let's nail down some pros and cons. On the positive side, the Sidewinder X2 is fast, precise, and quiet. It's very neat with good design thought put into cable management. I also like the option to choose between using a USB stick or SD card and the super fast heat up times. On the negative side, we have to list the patchy heating of the print bed as the worst offender. If you only want to print small items in the middle of the bed, then you won't have any problem. But if you're going to do this, buy a smaller printer and save yourself some money. When you want to print something that's going to wander into one of these cooler zones, you are going to have to give some thought to some extra help for bed adhesion. I'll probably find myself a shorter USB stick so I don't accidentally break it. And it would be nice to turn off that startup beep that would wake anyone up within a two mile radius. All in all, I really like the Artillery Sidewinder X2. It adds some additional firepower to my 3D printer arsenal. See what I did there? And delivers fast, accurate printing in a very user-friendly package. Yes, it has some faults, but nothing that isn't easily improved with a little bit of thought. Leave me a comment below if you have any experience with an Artillery Sidewinder X2, or if you're thinking of buying one. If you are thinking of buying one, at least check out the Geek Buying links below with the discount code. It's a massive discount on this printer. Click here to see other videos about 3D printing, or click here for another video you might like. Thanks for watching.